Hey, everybody. Happy Monday from the podcast daily. That is Bill Landis. And no, I am not Jeremy Birmingham. So the Monday rewatch, everyone's favorite of all of the podcast flavors is not the same. And guess what? I'm just going to say it up front. I did not rewatch the game. (laughs) I'm not going to pretend like I did. That game was one of the most mind numbing experiences watching Ohio State and Rutgers that I've had. So I'm just going to lay that out there. I I watched it. I took notes. I wrote about, I've written about it a few times. Have all the stats. I have a lot of anecdotes that I picked up before, during and after the game that I'm more than happy to share. But uh, <laughs> a rewatch bill was a bridge too far for me. Yeah, that's that's for the true sickos like myself. Uh, who, who, uh, it's a, we're recording this at eleven thirty a.m. on Sunday morning, and I have already rewatched the majority of the game. I, I will be forthright too, and say that I have not watched the final two offensive possessions once the starters got out of there. But I I have watched every play of the starting offense uh, and the starting defense up through the beginning of the fourth quarter, which I think is probably all I needed to watch. It's probably actually too much, but you know, I well. Enjoyed it. The- the best, uh, most entertaining sequence and the one that everyone wanted to talk about after the game did come uh, midway through the fourth quarter when you and I were getting ready to go down to the field. I thought, ah, there's not, we're not going to miss anything. Let's get out of here. Uh, <laughs> let's go get some color and hang out on the sideline. And then Jesse Murko decided to take matters into his own hands. Yeah, he saw, he saw all those rushing yards that Mayan Williams was getting. Was like, let, me, let me get some of those. I, don't, I mean, who can blame him? Um, I don't think he probably did not anticipate uh, setting off what he set off. But uh, credit to him, man. He's a fo- he's a football player. So did you go frame by frame through Greg Schiano running across the field or? Well, let's <laughs> let's start. This. Yeah. I did watch. I did rewatch this because I've had several conversations since Saturday night with people in the program. Uh, we talked about it on, on Sunday with, with the difference with Anthony Schlegel. Look. All of this started because Ohio State was content to let the game end. They felt like they were waving a white flag and that Greg Schiano should have recognized that. I can only give the Ohio State side. I don't cover Rutgers. But Greg Schiano decided to come after it, send a couple guys into the B gaps and three guys uh, up the middle to try and come after that punt and get a block when Ohio State was content to say that this game is over at 49 to 10. So. They didn't appreciate that part. Um, it was not called for Jesse Murko in that situation to do it, but he's playing the game and sees the the space in front of him. And he took that. And I don't think that Ohio State is upset with that because uh, you you want your player to recognize the situation and, and he needs reps in that too. So again, that's not to assign blame, but Rutgers is the one that decided to try and block that punt. Yeah, I... I... I don't know. It doesn't seem to me like much of the the consternation about this is is about the play itself, right? It seems like it's it's more about what happened after the fact. I, I can't sure. recall. I can't recall seeing a coach um, on the other sideline, a head coach on the other team <laughs> sideline. So, like, I get if the, if that gets people fired up, I certainly understand that. I I, I will say I un, I understand the um, motivation, I guess, to want to pull your guy out of a situation like that. There was basically like three Rutgers players over there on Ohio State's entire sideline. So I, I get when they pull them out of there. Um, Greg Schiano came over there with a bit of steam too, though. Like it wasn't just like he was coming there to, to uh, you know, dissipate things. He, he looked like he came over there with a mission and maybe something to say uh, to Ryan Day in the Ohio State sideline as well. So like if you're if you're Greg Schiano in that situation and you, and you were upset about the fact that Jesse Murko ran that ball, like you you asked for it, as you alluded to. You were really asking for it the entire game with all the the trickiness you were trying to do, try to open the second half with a with a I don't know what that onside kick was. And like that's all I'm not saying don't do that stuff. That's all fair game, but just don't right. get mad when it happens to you. Like I that that's what I don't understand. I saw I don't I don't remember where there were a lot of good screen grabs and photos uh of of the initial uh, brouhaha, including one with both Ryan Day and Greg Schiano pointing at each other. I don't know if anybody has photoshopped that into the Sistine Chapel yet, because uh, <laughs> that was a fantastic moment. Uh, and again, it's not to assign blame that, oh, Rutgers started this or Greg Schiano started this and then escalated it by running across the field. I, I, you know, 
I think that's sort of my read on the situation, but they should try to win the game. I have no problem with that. They were doing that from the start. I think there was some frustration left over from the last couple meetings with Ohio State and Rutgers that Greg Schiano, they're down three, four touchdowns and pulling out some of these onside kicks and the fakes and extending the game for no real reason. And that started again on Saturday night pretty early with the first onside kick. And like, I just, I don't, I think the Buckeyes feel like they're in a no win situation in that Mm -hmm. Rutgers gets to try whatever it wants. It knows it's a massive underdog. And even when the Buckeyes start putting in Kyle McCord and only handing off, like they're trying to win and make the score look closer. Like if Ohio state, like, through it with Kyle McCord, I guess their feeling is they'd be accused of running up the score and being bad sports. And you can't have it both ways where Ohio State has to stop and you can't compete anymore and Rutgers gets to do whatever the hell it wants. Like that, yeah. Some people get hurt in that situation. And, you know, Jesse Murko may have even been one of those because he didn't take the last punt. Uh, Michael O'Shaughnessy was in there uh, after that hit and he was the one who dropped that one inside the, the five or whatever the last one it was. So, you know, I don't. I mean, I'm, that's pure speculation at my point, but it was a pretty big hit for a punter to take for somebody who doesn't get hit ever. I, I don't have a good feel, I guess, for what should happen in this situation. Like, I, I kind of felt this way last week, too, when they were playing Wisconsin, when it's like they put Kyle McCord in the game. He's handing the ball off every down. He clearly looks frustrated. We want to see him throw the ball more. And Ryan Day says, well, we're, we're trying to be – um, good sports about it and not show somebody up. But on the other side of that, like Braylon Allen's still in the game running against Ohio State's second team defense. So like what my, my opinion, as I've said several times, is like as long as the game's happening, especially in a conference game, like I just don't think showing somebody up in a conference game is a thing that that happens or even should be considered. If right. you're playing, if you're paying Toledo $2 million to come get its buck kicked, maybe you consider it then, um, especially for an in-state team. You don't, you don't want to embarrass them um, just sort of needlessly. But I don't – in the Big Ten, it shouldn't matter. You're all big boys. You're all getting paid a ton of money to, to put a, a product on the field. If you're not good enough, that's your fault. That's not that's not my fault. So, like, we're going to keep playing the game. And if you're going to keep doing annoying stuff, like, throughout the entire game when you – like, if we're – again, I guess you're trying to win, but at a certain point it just becomes unnecessary. Um, don't get mad when a kid just makes a play. Like, I, I – it just doesn't – don't dish it out if you can't take it, I guess, is, is what I'm getting at. And, and Greg Schiano seemed to um, take exception to that, even if after the game he said he did not. Yeah. Um, both of those guys are have been through a lot of post-game press conferences, and they gave very uh, PC answers that I don't believe, I strongly believe, it doesn't reveal their true feelings about the situation. Yeah. <laughs> I I'll don't believe it, either one of them. Yeah. Uh, I'll put it... I'll put it that way. Um, all right, so this is this Monday show is usually you're in Berm's baby. I'll where do you want to start? I'll let you you take control here. Yeah, I maybe start with CJ Stroud because um I was actually just sort of rewatching his post game press conference because I was talking to other people while he was at the podium and just some of the stuff he said about some of the throws on on Saturday that were um a little errant or 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 forced and and I do think he he admitted to this, like maybe he's struggling a little bit with when, as we talked about on the post game snap judgments, when a team is is sort of playing you to force you to run the ball. CJ probably has to do a better job of of taking taking what's given to him. But but that said, like I was just looking at all his all his passes. So like he completes fifty nine percent of his throws, and for CJ Stroud, like that's a number that, that kind of catches your attention because he's usually so efficient. Um, so he's eleven com- incomplete passes. Two of those are on illegal touching. <laughs> like that's not <laughs> those aren't bad throws from CJ. And okay, those yeah. two those two incompletions dropped his completion percentage by nine points. So like if he's if he completes sixty eight percent of his passes, maybe people people feel a little bit differently about that. It's not to say that he wasn't forcing things because he definitely was. Um, right. But there were other points too. Like Rutgers blitzed him a lot in this game, and 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 maybe that was unexpected. Um, I was looking at the Pro Football Focus stuff and. They blitzed him on 50% of his dropbacks, which is a pretty high number. And he's typically not phased by by that stuff, but I thought it did get to him on on at least two throws. Um, he had that third down throw to a Mecca where he like threw it behind him and a Mecca almost caught it going to the ground. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And and he couldn't quite step into that one all the way. And, and maybe that's why he kind of left it behind them. And he he said as much, I think, after the game. He wishes he could have stepped into that one a little bit more. Um, and then later, um, might have been the next drive, maybe. he uh, Or maybe the drive before, I can't quite remember. But he had a, like a, a shot down the sideline to Marvin Harrison to Jr. Marvin, yeah. yeah, where there was some pressure, too. And um, he kind of, I, th- I think he got hit as he, as he threw it, or there was a guy like at his feet and he kind of pulled the string a little bit. So that's not stuff we're accustomed to seeing from him. But when, when an offense only has 46 plays, um, the, the bad ones tend to stick out a little more. And uh, when they have, you know, only half of those are, are passing attempts, the, the handful or even less than a handful really that CJ's a little off on tend to stand out more too but it was it was the kind of thing for me with rewatching it it was like well that wasn't quite as bad rewatching it as as it felt kind of coming out of watching it live for the first time yeah i think that as we're sitting there I, the, usually when he misses it's a little bit wild high and the deep balls are so consistently great that i think we were taken aback a little bit on the deep throw to marvin it's like if Marvin gets a step and CJ's throwing a deep ball, like that's game over. That's going to be a touchdown. Mm-hmm. And so that wasn't, you know, the normal kind of miss for him. I thought there were some even even like I think there was a third round, third down kind of stick route to a Mecca that was like if he throws to the inside shoulder, maybe a Mecca cuts it up and gets 10 more yards. I think they were going into the red zone and it was kind of it was behind him and it was like, took a Mecca by surprise with the place yeah. there was nothing he could do. He got the first down and the throw was on target, but maybe not to the perfect target. And I think we said that a couple times, just when we were sitting in the press box on Saturday night, that seam route to a Mecca early on, it was like, okay, well that's a good ball. And it's between coverage. It's like, well, what if it had been here? Maybe he scores and walks into the end zone. And that's sort of the, like, I feel like the last two weeks that I am nitpicking someone who's extremely good and I'm not grading him against, let's say, a JT Barrett standard for a passing performance. Like that would have been fine and efficient. And you know, you don't complain about 49 to 10. You just go on to the next one. But there are the two things, and I may have said this on Saturday night that we're holding him to a Heisman trophy winning standard, because we know that he, that's a goal that he's talked about openly. And we know that he's capable of delivering that and national championship when the stakes get higher and the talent is equated, as they like to say, and the competitive stamina is more acquired. And I think that they're just, I'm not quite sure how to describe it. I think that a game like Rutgers didn't keep him as mentally engaged, perhaps as some mm-hmm. others. I, I just, and you, you bring up a point that maybe they saw some things they didn't prepare for. And, uh, or the number of blitzes, or you know, it's, again, it's hard for me to sit there and say exactly what that is. But it's like you get up so comfortably against Rutgers; it's human nature to get bored. And even if you're in the game, like you're that much better than your opponent. And again, that is all just me sitting here and evaluating it from outside the program. But I think that maybe that's why Ryan Day dialed up some of those red zone throws that that didn't work. It was like let's let's give CJ something to give you know to chew on and work with. I think that's right, um, and it, it did get him in the trouble a little bit. Like, and that's that's kind of what I was saying on Saturday. I just think like it's it's sort of CJ and Ryan Day tied together. Um, just and when they went forty nine to ten, they were never in jeopardy of losing the game. Like this isn't a thing that you necessarily apply to the Rutgers game. It's just a, a thing maybe you take from it and kind of look down the road and say, well, when they encounter this situation again, what's it going to look like? And when like we know what a Greg Schiano defense typically looks like he he coached it here for what four <laughs> years um the, there wasn't what, a lot of var- varying variance in those looks uh, yeah, I don't there know. was there was not but like think like when he was coaching here like ohio state wasn't playing two safeties over the top umbrella coverage take away sure. all the deep balls but that's what they were doing to ohio state on saturday and it's understandable a lot of teams are going to do that notre dame tried to do it wisconsin tried to do it that's why they've had so so much success running the ball i, I think this year and that's been encouraging to see but um, I think it does take a, a little bit of um, recalibration sometimes for CJ and Ryan Day to to call some different stuff. Like I, CJ definitely forced some stuff, but I think Ryan Day could have helped him out a little more by maybe calling some some things that were just targeting targeting shallower areas of the field. And it is a question I have in my mind now moving forward 
Um, maybe not so much for next week against Michigan State, but when they come back off that bye week um, and then go up to Penn State at the end of the month, like Manny Diaz and that defense are going to come after CJ. They're going to try to light him up. If they they've blitzed seventy percent of the time, I wouldn't be surprised in that game. And like, what does Ohio State have in its arsenal to combat that? Whether it's screen passes, like yeah. quick game with 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 the passing game with CJ and the receivers, um, you don't have to do it against Rutgers because you're so much better than them. But maybe I would I would have liked to see them do it in this game just to give me a little bit of peace of mind for the next time that they get into a game against a better opponent where an opponent takes a, a similar tactic against, against, against Ohio state's offense. Yeah. I think what's, what's interesting to me is that you, you have, you're making that conscious decision. And we talked about it after Notre Dame and how similar it was to the Northwestern big 10 championship game. And like we speculated and like, are we, is everyone going to play Ohio state this way? It seems like the best way to give yourself a chance to stay in it. And that's not been the case, you know, over the last three or four weeks. And it, it'll change depending on people's personnel. But like, I wonder like how, how content a defensive coordinator could really be after they see what Mayan Williams did on Saturday night or what he did in the fourth quarter. Uh, he and Travion Henderson laid against Notre Dame, like, uh, or what a healthy Travion if he gets back from, you know, the foot setback. Like, I, is that really what you want? Like, you just yeah. want teams to run it down your throat and like you don't even get to play offense. Like it seems like that's sort of what we've been hinting at all along that Ohio State is now at a point where they can run anything they want offensively. And the defense has to make a choice going into the game what way that they're okay dying. And I think <laughs> and and that can't be fun, but I do think that when those defenses make their decision that's what they're going to do. And sometimes when their decision is to let Ohio State run, Ryan Day and or Kevin Wilson or even CJ or, or whoever, Kevin, you know, whatever else, they're like, ah, maybe they'll change. Let's, let's get, they're going to get out of this. We're going to be able to throw it. And like, they're less willing to just be like, okay, well, this week we have to kill them with poison and we don't get to use our sword. Like, well, the, they yeah, have, yeah. they may have to be more willing to, to do that. The the problem is that the sword is really sharp, right? So so like even <laughs> even when you think it's not the best but the best weapon to use, um, you've seen enough from from the sword to know that it can make some throws that a lot of other people can't make. Uh, which is which is what happened, I think, on that that interception to start the second half. Like CJ said, CJ said I shouldn't have thrown it. Um, they kind of blanketed that that coverage, and the nickel ran ran with the mecca. But then at the end, he said, like, I can make that throw. I just have to make it better. <laughs> it's like, yeah. all right, whatever whatever you say, man. Yeah, I don't believe that on that one. <laughs> like, the one that we all went crazy about last year that I thought was the most impressive all year was in, it was sort of into a triangle of coverage against Indiana. Mm -hmm. and it was like, how in the world did that get there? I don't think when you add one more body and that window shrinks even tighter into quadruple coverage, which I don't even remember – ever seeing that happen in a game before where one guy draws four bodies i don't i don't know how he could have got that one in there i i wish i could watch him throw that pass 10 times to see how he can make it successful <laughs> i think if you give him 10 tries he could figure it out because because I, I do believe in him that much as a thrower but like on that play <laughs> mayan williams and kate stover are just like sitting there two yards off the line of scrimmage with nobody within 10 yards of them like and and I think CJ will probably watch it back and say like just dump it off to them, go on to the next play. And that's just the kind of stuff I think he has to get more and more comfortable with with taking um, when it's available to him. Um, there's not like you said like there's a there's a pick your poison kind of thing happening here with the offense. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as they keep scoring when they get into the red zone, I, like I, I don't know what you do. And and they're doing. I know I know. This was not the cleanest example of that, but they still scored when they got down there. So that was the thing last year. Like teams tried to play them this way, and then when they got into the red zone, they had to settle for field goals quite a bit. Um, they've really not had to do that this year. So as long as that keeps happening, you can try to play two over the top and make them run. You can try to play an extra guy in the box and and live that way. I think either way, Ohio State's probably going to score on you. So that's I, I don't have major concerns about them. It's just that. Sometimes in a game like that, especially when there's so few plays, um, it feels probably clunkier than it actually is as it's happening. Yep. The, the other only other thing to wrap that up is that you mentioned Kate and mine both being there, whether it's a check down or whether it's a shorter safe run underneath throw to the tight ends, like 
that is a part of Ohio State's arsenal now, specifically at tight end with Cade Stover. So uh, it may sound crazy to say it this way, but I don't think there should be games where he where Cade Stover comes out of it with one reception for 12 yards. And so that's the sort of stuff that maybe a year ago, like, ah, well, that's not really what Ohio State is. Not going to work in the middle of the field that much or, or underneath to the tight ends. And now you can and should. Uh, so those are the probably like the easy access throws that I wrote about uh, on Sunday morning. Again, it's not that CJ Stroud has magically lost the ability overnight to make incredible throws in or even to still go on and win the Heisman. I think it's just a mini slump. And part of it, again, still is that Jackson Smith and Jigba is not available. Um, we can talk about that later. We will a lot throughout the week um, as we get a little bit more insight into what's going on there with the hamstring and when uh, he will be back for the Buckeyes. But like, I, I think some of these things, what they want to do in the passing attack and CJ wanting probably deep down to not not run the football all game long, makes it tough and doesn't take some of the things that would move the chains and still allow him to accumulate stats and obviously a better higher percentage uh, of pass completions. Well, that, that completion to Stover, it was the, I think it was his first completion of the game um, is exactly what I think we're talking about. We just want to see him like they ran, I think it was like a smash concept with him and Julian on the left side, Julian Fleming kind of runs like the corner route. And and Kate Stover runs like I guess a, a hook or, or a comeback or whatever underneath that, and the defense got so much depth because they're terrified yeah. of getting beat over the top. That Cade's by himself, <laughs> just flip <laughs> it to him, and he gets twelve yards, like the easiest twelve yards ever. So, and that was if you watch CJ, like he looks high, high's taken away, he comes back down to to his lower read, like it's simple quarterback play, and he does that all the time. It's not like it's not like I'm saying like he doesn't do this at all. Like he's done it a lot. Um, I just think like maybe he is in a little bit of a funk where where the offense is is different than he thought it would be, and he feels more of an urgency to take shots when maybe he shouldn't. But um, to your point about the Heisman, like he's still the second rate, highest rated passer in the country, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I think has like eighteen touchdowns and two interceptions. Yeah. Um, and I don't I, there's there's some people out there who are like not even talking about CJ when it comes to the Heisman, and maybe it's too early to talk about anybody for the Heisman, but um, he's right he's right there. Like there's no. He didn't lose any ground, I don't think. Yeah, I I think everybody probably assumes that he's going to win it. And so in September or the first week of October, you can be like, hey, this guy from Kansas is a Heisman favorite now because I'm sure he's going to stay undefeated into November or or even past next weekend or shouldn't maybe even be undefeated now. But that's (laughs) it'll drive more interest to talk about all the other candidates when you already know that CJ Stroud is at at worst, probably going to be a finalist as long as he's still breathing. Yeah, I guess they're not really talking about Bryce Young either. So I don't know. Yeah. It's a, it's the time of it's the time of year when you uh, talk about those kind of guys. But that kid from Kansas is good. Like I, I'll, I'll give him his props. He is playing well. Yeah, he's not Heisman good, but uh, <laughs> but and and what did they score yesterday? Fourteen points. Um, hey, they got a they got a they got a dub, man. It's all they did get a they're dub. Fine. They're getting Congrats. game day this week. Congrats to Matt Campbell for uh, making a return to more on Monday, uh, losing to Kansas. Um, what? Where else? Where else did your eyes go on your official sicko rewatch? Yeah, you know, honestly, like the, I, I don't think there's a ton much to get into besides besides the CJ stuff. I thought I thought the run blocking was pretty good, um, and the pass blocking left a little something to be desired. But again, I think much of that is a product of of pressure that Rutgers was bringing, just bringing extra guys a lot. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't like they were lining up with four and just beating Ohio State's tackles around the edge. Like, it wasn't anything like that. So I don't find it particularly alarming. It just made it a little more clunkier, I guess, than it had to be. But if we were hoping to see the offensive line just continue to kind of mash up front, um, I thought they did that for, for the most part. There were some two- and three-yard runs in there, but even that kind of stuff, like you said in the press box, there was one run from Mayan where he could have probably tried to string out a wide zone run. I think it was like third and one, maybe. Yeah, and, yep. and maybe he would have got dropped for a loss, but instead he just like cut it up and got the two or three yards he needed. Yeah, that's the stuff that's impressing me, and that's why I keep saying that I think he's just a better fit for what they want to do. And I do not mean it. I swear, I will repeat it over and over just so that I'm clear that I don't think Travion Henderson is good. He's exceptionally good. 
And when it comes to straight line speed and explosiveness, he's got more than that than Mayan. And But why they are such a good complement and why I think Mayan is currently better in the lead role is because of that willingness in third and one and third and two. And it's not fair for me to say this, but hypothetically, in my mind, it was easy to see if that was Travion, and I've seen him do it before, that same play, the same concept, and going to the, you know, going to the field, him trying to just wait and wait and wait because he's he's banking on good offensive linemen eventually opening a hole where he can go for 60 yards. And Mayan, if he's like got just half of a hip and knows that he has to get one or two yards, I can't remember if it was third or one or third or two, or third and two, but He's like, well, there's the first down, and I'm going to take it because then you get another carry after that and maybe another carry after that. So, again, that's not fair for me to create this hypothetical, basing it just off of what I've seen before and what I like about Mayan Williams' game right now. And it doesn't mean that a healthy Travion's not involved. doesn't mean that he's not getting a lot of carries. Uh, we've seen them complement within the same game and, and then mix and match a rotation that's not necessarily based on you get one series and you get the next series. He's willing Mayan Williams to put his face mask on people in the short yarded situations, in the tough situations that Ryan Day spent all offseason talking about. You know, if it's blocked for one, get two. And if it's blocked for three or four, get five and six. That's what Ohio State needs from its running game. I, and I, I just think that he's maybe slightly ahead in those situations. And I don't, Travion Henderson can, could make up that ground. I think. Maybe that's something that we saw against Wisconsin with how hard he was running in that game. Is like, I better start doing this myself, or else I'm not going to get, you know, the primary role or the starter starting amount of touches or any of that sort of stuff because mine's so good at it right now. And that's where they push each other. That's where they can get better. I don't think either one is unhappy about it. And Travion came here expecting to split time with Evan Pryor. I don't like. I don't think he's going to throw any fit about that. They're ha- they seem to be genuinely happy for each other. But I, I just. Last night sort of reinforced the idea to me that in those situations, and especially in the red zone, and he's got five tutties now to talk about, you know, to back that up, four of them in those situations where it seemed pretty easy to hand it to him, that he can get the job done and he knows what's required of him there. Yeah, uh, he he just obliterated my uh, season bowl prediction that CJ Stroud was going <laughs> to rush for more touchdowns than Mayan Williams. Uh, which I, I, I think I'll I'll take the L on that one. I don't think okay, we need to wait yeah. to see. We don't need to wait to see how that plays out for the rest of the year. Yeah, um, I I do think uh, it felt like Trevion was kind of coming around to the stuff we're talking about in the second half, which made it like more of a bummer that he couldn't play against Rutgers, but like most of the other injuries that don't seem like they're super long-term, yeah. it's not worth risking against Rutgers if you don't have to. So um, I get it. And and we'll see, I guess, if he plays against Michigan state, but that's another guy you need to make sure that he's like Jackson Smith and Jigba fresh um, for the stretch run. But it was, it was, you got to see like quintessential Mayan, which is the stuff, the stuff we're talking about, but also too, like he, there were a couple of runs that were really bottled up where he made, one or two guys miss and turn something that probably should have been a loss into like a 12 yard game. Right. Um, and he had that 70 yard touchdown where the safety is kind of flew up the field and, and he outran a couple of guys too, which I wasn't a hundred percent sure um, that he had in him. So he is um, more of a complete back this year, I think than, than certainly I anticipated. Um, and that was by, by far the best display, I think of, of his various skills. So um I think it just leaves him in a good spot because you know what Trevion is like. He's if he was a bell cow anywhere, he'd be considered one of the best running backs in the country. And do right. you have him? And now you have Mayan, who looks honestly like very much the same. So it's it's a it's a good thing to have two guys like that. It's not it's not a thing I think that fosters controversy or, or is a bad thing for the offense. What did you see in the secondary upon second watch? Um, are we talking about one guy in in particular? <laughs> Uh, I like that. So Denzel Burke is in really good position on both those plays and just doesn't seem to know where the ball is. And as I'm watching those plays, I'm thinking like part of me is like, man, that looks really bad. I don't, I'm not sure how, how a guy who's played as much as Denzel can kind of be that lost in coverage. But then on the other hand, like he hasn't been playing corner all that long. So I don't, I, I feel like maybe in an odd way, some of the things that you would expect to show up for a guy who really didn't play cornerback in high school are showing up this year 
and they didn't mm. show up that much last year. Maybe they started to show up toward the end of the year last year. I don't know if that's teams like figuring him out a little bit or, or figuring out strengths and weaknesses and, and, and attacking the ladder. Um, but it, he's just not really physical enough at, at the catch point. And, and on those two plays in particular, just really seem to lack an awareness for, for where the ball is. But he's in good position, uh, which I think is hard enough to do. So maybe if he's there, if he's where he's supposed to be, then then he can be coached up by Tim Walton on on how to better find the ball. But um, I would I'm I'm a little nervous about that. As I said after the game, when they go up against a team like Michigan State, who's going to try to test that, I think certainly um, Penn State will. Penn State's got some pretty solid receivers um, down the road. Michigan definitely will. So it's got to be fixed. You can't you can't have a, a weak link out there. Um, I do think their pass rush has been good enough to negate some of that to the point where, like, I don't think teams are just going to be able to drop back on every play and bomb it on them. But mm-hmm. um, you have to be a little more aware, I think, if you're if you're a quote unquote veteran guy like Denzel is. I think that's the that's the hang up, right? Like you brought up the point that he hasn't been playing corner all that long, and he is five games into his sophomore season. Coaches, especially, like to say. Once you get in the middle of your first year, you've started six games. Like you're no longer a freshman, and you know that's fun to say, and maybe not entirely all the way true. Maybe it'd be one of those cliches that I should ask Ryan Day about if he believes in them or not. Because, like, <laughs> you know, if this was a third or fourth year guy with a, a three years worth of practice reps and ten to twenty game appearances and starts, you'd be like, "Well, this guy just—it's not going to happen. He's never going to get it." And I don't know that we can say that after, you know, 17 games, 18 games for Denzel Burke. He's he's been injured at times throughout, you know, the year and a half. And he was pressed into a situation earlier. And and I thought he handled it very well. But that doesn't mean that the the growth curve is always going to stay smooth. There's going to be peaks and valleys. And I, I don't it's the same sort of deal. Like when we're talking about Travion, we've seen that the ability is there. All right. The athleticism is there. We know he's been a very he's a very confident cornerback. He's certainly not un, he's not afraid to go back out there and take another challenge and take another shot. And, you know, I just think that's sort of the complex equation that Tim Walton and Jim Knowles have to figure out. Like, did they I thought they needed to let J- Jair Brown play and get some of those same reps and go through some of the same process uh, because Denzel had more of that already a year ago. And you're trying to build depth for the future, but I guess in their mind, if they still feel like he is early, relatively early in the development process, that they should just let him work through that. And I can understand that justification, but I don't think that it makes a lot of sense if it comes at the expense of Jair Brown. And again, like it's not for me. They're paid a lot more money, and their livelihoods are on on the line. So I don't think they would make that without a lot of thought. Um, I'm sure that there were a lot of conversations on the headsets about when the right opportunity to do that would be. But, you know, those two plays, there were also two tackles or attempted tackles that come to mind where it didn't look like, whether it's because of the hand or whatever else, like he was going to stick his face in there to make those plays on the perimeter when it was coming his way. I I just didn't, you know, I didn't feel like it was a great performance and it it was easier for me to sit in the press box and be like, Let's see somebody else. But yeah, we call we call those business decisions. Um, <laughs> I, I maybe it is the hand. I don't know. I, it's probably difficult to figure out how to play and what you can do when you have a situation where basically you're you're playing with one hand. Um, the way that yeah. the way that he is, he didn't he didn't have the club on uh, like Damon Arnett, but he had basically like half a cast on his hand. Um, and I'm sure that does create some hesitancy, both to go make a tackle and also probably to like play through a receiver's hands. Um, but if and and I I'm not I'm not um, ignoring the fact that it probably takes a lot of time to get comfortable with that, but at a certain point, if you're not comfortable doing it, then you become a liability. So mm-hmm. I, I and I don't know I don't know how long you let that play out. I guess it may, and I know we typically save our, our our what questions are we looking to ask <laughs> thing for for Tuesday, but I I'm curious now about how you approach that when when a guy is clearly struggling, and on one hand you want to let him like try to figure it out. But on the other hand, you want to have some accountability for poor play. And it feels to me like they're kind of stuck in the middle there with with that position in particular. And it doesn't help things like Cameron Brown's unavailable. 
Mm-hmm. Um, maybe, maybe if Cameron Brown was available or obviously Jordan Hancock, um, and I think they feel pretty good about J.K. Johnson, clearly, if they let him play basically the entire game, maybe that would have been a situation where they would have made a change at the position. Um, I, but I don't know. I, I, I thought I have saw enough from Jair Brown against Wisconsin that I would have let him certainly give it a go against Rutgers. Yeah. Um, I don't – maybe – I don't – he wasn't on the availability report. Maybe there's something going on there with him too that, that, that we're not well, privy to. Who knows? <laughs> but it was weird. It was weird to not give him any run um, in a game where the team you're playing is not much of a threat and the guy out there is is clearly still trying to figure some stuff out. All right. Anything else? Um, no. Maybe like just uh, again a really good game from Steel Chambers. Um. They, it felt like Rutgers targeted him specifically twice with a couple of throwback plays, and he was um, he did a good job of diagnosing the first one and getting out to the sideline and making the stop. And the second one, he was just very patient, um, like and didn't take any of the eye candy. Made a tackle, I think, for like a seven yard loss. Um, it was it was his best game, I thought, as as a linebacker so far. And, and again, like similar to the point with Denzel Burke. I think sometimes we forget that Steel Chambers, while he played linebacker in high school, was still very new to playing linebacker at the collegiate mm-hmm. level. So um, I thought that there was um, some maturity there in the way that he approached some of those plays just by staying home and, and making the simple play and and not letting Rutgers get into some nonsense that makes that game more interesting than it, <laughs> than it should be. So um, good game from him, a really good game from the defensive line. Although I will say, like Rutgers' offensive line, I don't know what the hell they were doing on <laughs> some of these <laughs> plays. I tweeted out a couple of snapshots uh, on Sunday. There was one play where four guys were blocking JT Tuimoloau and another play where three guys were blocking Mike Hall. And I'm watching some of these run plays thinking to myself, like, man, these linebackers are really clean. How is it that no one's touching them? And it's like, oh, because four guys are blocking <laughs> one player. So um, that's not going to happen when Ohio State plays good teams. But uh, I'll say the same thing I've said all year. Uh, they can only play the team that's in front of them. And to this point, they have mostly shut those teams down. So it was another good game for the defense. My favorite Rutgers play was the uh, jet motion, run the wide receiver directly at the quarterback <laughs> to take him out and prevent a handoff for the zone uh, read. That was my favorite. Just three guys colliding in the backfield. It really looked smooth. Uh, you don't know who you're supposed to tackle. I guess if Sam Hubbard had been out there, he would have wrapped up all three <laughs> of them and all of them. Yeah. just tossed them over his head a little bit. But um, kudos to you, Rutgers, for playing a game and doing your best. They Thanks for something. visiting Columbus. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry that I'm not Berm. I know ever all of you wanted him to be here for the very special Monday rewatch, Bill and Berm special. He'll be back next week. I will stay out of the way. Uh, I'm not sorry that I didn't rewatch the game. I'm, I love you all very much, America, but I'm not going to do that for you. There are just some things that are uh, too much to ask, and rewatching Rutgers is one of them. Um, but uh, thanks for thanks to Bill for letting me hang out with him for one of these. Uh, as Berm enjoys the rest of his birthday celebration, he will be back, and we will have a lot more coverage uh, later on on Monday. We'll be in Roosters. Uh, for the live show in the Horseshoe Lounge, uh, and maybe a few other uh, special things as we get ready for the week ahead and a trip to Michigan State. For Bill, I am Austin. We will see you later.